Thank you very much. Would you turn with me in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 3? I would respond to that meditation by asking myself, yea, ask all of us, do you have streams and rivers in your lonely wilderness? I was reading just this week a statement by C.H. Spurgeon, who was struggling at the time that he wrote what I'm about to share with you with a tremendous trial and a heavy load upon him in the ministry in the midst of this trial. And going home one afternoon, he would walk in and to the office and home again. He was struggling with the busyness and the limitations physically that he had because of the busyness when the Spirit of God brought to his mind, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, my grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. That's the river in the wilderness that the Spirit of God gave to C.H. Spurgeon on that day. And C.H. Spurgeon started to think about what is air to the birds that fly through the sky? Yea, what is the ocean to the fish who swim through it? Such is the grace of God to the child of God, the believer in Jesus Christ. We are immersed in his grace. We breathe in his grace. We are surrounded by his grace. And God's trying to make us aware of his grace. It is sufficient for whatever we face. And so C.H. Spurgeon then wrote this. This is what he wrote. I haven't told you yet. He said, O believers, be big believers. A little faith will bring you to heaven, but a very large faith will bring heaven to you. Thank you, Lord. Oh, that God would increase our faith. Jesus said to his disciples, O ye of little faith, O ye of little faith. May God increase our faith that we might have the blessedness of his presence in the midst of our storm. Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessedness of your presence that you have sent forth your spirit into our hearts. And may we, Father, be believers of all that you have blessed us with, for you have given to us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for it, Father, and pray that our, the eyes of our understanding would be opened to see it even more and more, that we are surrounded by your grace, we are immersed in your grace, even as the fish in the ocean. May we be believing believers and enjoy the presence of our heavenly Father, and, and the presence of your spirit in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for this blessed truth, Christ in us. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Our text is 1 Peter chapter 3, and we want to finish up today with verses 15 through 17. We have been looking together at the believer's good conduct in Christ. And for two weeks now, we've seen the emphasis that we should understand of our position in Christ connected with our good behavior because our good behavior is rooted in our position in Christ. Please follow along as I read verses 15 through 17. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil." The word conduct here in verse 16, as we have pointed out, it's almost a year ago to the day, is a major theme in Peter's epistle. Nine times Peter uses this word, 
that is translated either conduct or behavior. Uh, in, in our King James translation, you'll see it as conversation. In the New King James, it's conduct as it is here in our text. One translation has put it this way, keep your behavior excellent. The word speaks of our mode of life. It's our beliefs. It's our beliefs put into action, our words, our thoughts, and our doings. It's our everyday behavior. And nothing could be more practical than what we do and say as a child of God to our testimony, being a witness for Jesus Christ who saved us from our sins. As I said, this is a major theme in this epistle. Turn back with me to chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, this is where we emphasized it almost a year ago to the day. Peter writes, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct, that's our word, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. And there is a day of visitation when God will judge all the world. Every soul that lives will stand before their creator. We will stand before God. I pray that you have found Jesus Christ as your savior because you've called upon him to save you so that you will stand in confidence before the Lord and not in fear of the judgment that will come upon any and everyone who rejects Jesus Christ. Notice here in verse 11 of chapter 2 that Peter writes to the believers and calls them sojourners. He calls them pilgrims, and that's what we are. We are pilgrims. This is no longer our home. Jesus prayed. We may see it a little bit later on this morning in John chapter 17 that his disciples were in the world but they were no longer of the world. Through faith in Jesus Christ, they were now children of God, and they belonged to their Father and have a position as we have been looking, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5, 6, and 7. We have a position in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Heaven is our home, and we are living in this world journeying towards our home. That's why the Apostle Paul can write, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that we are ambassadors for Christ. We are statesmen on behalf of our heavenly Father. Paul will write in Philippians 3, we are citizens in heaven when you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so we are pilgrims, Peter writes, and we are only here for a short time. We are only passing through on our way to our heavenly home. And God is very concerned about our conduct. Here in verse 12, we have our word, and the context, context here is that we should have our conduct honorable, honorable among the Gentiles. And it just means the word good or excellent. Our conduct should be excellent while we are living here. In our passage, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, we have seen the aspect that our conduct is rooted in our position. Our good behavior or conduct is in Christ. If we placed our faith in Christ, we have been positioned in Christ as we have seen, and this is the basis from which we are to live. We are to think from our position in Christ. We are to speak from our position in Christ. We are to act from our position in Christ. This is our, our uh, position that we have given to us. Notice in chapter 1 now, First Peter chapter 1, we saw earlier in verse 15, Peter writes, I'll read verse 14 and 15, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. It's a holy behavior. God is very clear in explaining this. We have been uh, made children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And now God no longer wants us to live, no longer wants us to think and speak and choose what we do 
in our old desires and our old fleshly habits. No, we are made a new creation in Christ, as we've been looking at the last couple weeks. And God now calls us to live a life of holiness, a life that exemplifies our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Holy One of God. We're called to holiness of life. And listen, apart from our position, and we'll see today that mighty enablement that God has given to us, uh, we have no ability in our flesh. But God has made us a new creation in Christ and calls us on the basis of that position in Christ to live an excellent behavior in the world, a holy behavior in the world. It is not just how we act when we gather together in the assembly of the saints. That's very important. But it's when we go out of these doors and back into the world that we are to demonstrate the work of God in our lives and to live the righteous holiness of our Savior. He saved us to that purpose. He's positioned us to that purpose, and he's called us to that purpose, holiness of life. Not to be living aimlessly and wandering around. Look at verse 18 knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. It's not an empty behavior that's wandering about. No, as pilgrims, we're living with a real purpose, a new purpose, a new sense. As a child of God, we are journeying towards our home in heaven All the while, as we live here, our behavior is a witness to our living Savior, Jesus Christ, who has transformed us to be like him. In chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, we didn't look at depth in these verses, only mentioned them in our study. But notice when Peter writes, writes to wives, the godly wife, in a home where in this particular illustration or example that Peter uses, she has an unsaved husband. How is she to live as a believer before her unsaved husband? Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct, the behavior of their wives, when they, the unsaved husband, observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. And so the wife is to be a believing wife who shows forth the purity of God and the fear of God in her life. She has a great respect and honor for the Lord. He's first. He's number one. I will honor my Lord. And this does not cause a disruption in the home. Uh, To be sure, there may be disruptions if the husband who's unbelieving Uh, is chafing against the holiness of God in his wife's life, but she is to be a testimony and a witness in her home of her salvation because she's a believer in Jesus Christ and she's a pilgrim, just like we all are through faith in Jesus Christ. We are pilgrims. And so that brings us to our text in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16. As we've said, we see that this conduct, as we're pilgrims, we're not here forever, We are here looking forward to our heavenly home. And this is not my home. I don't have to think the way the world thinks. I don't have to do what the world tells me to do. I don't have to follow my fallen, sinful, fleshly desires. I now have a new desire to honor my Lord and to live in alignment with my citizenship in heaven. Yea, my heavenly position, 1 Peter 3.16, it is a good behavior in Jesus Christ. We've noted that this position in Christ, then, is the mystery. God did not reveal this in the Old Testament. This is something that God has made known in this particular age. And I think I will give a little commercial. I think I will give a little advertisement at this point. Lord willing, next Sunday, if we're not home in heaven, the rapture doesn't come, we'll be here in Sunday school, adult Sunday school, at 9 a.m., and we are going to look, beginning to look at Matthew chapters 24 and 25. This is a plug. We'd love to have you join us. And we are going to see the conclusion of the Jewish age. That's what Matthew 24 and 25 is all about. The conclusion 
of the Jewish age. We're not in that age. We are in the Christian age. We are in an age and a time that was a mystery, not revealed in the Old Testament, not made known in the Old Testament, but now has been revealed. We are living in the age of grace, according to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2, and we are the church. We are the body, yea, we are the bride of Christ. And we are living in this age, which, by the way, is going to come to an immediate conclusion at the rapture of the church and the resurrection of church-age saints, at which point the clock of Daniel chapter 9 will begin to tick again and there will be the conclusion of the Jewish age as foretold in the Old Testament. But we'll talk about that in our Sunday school class together. We are in the Christian age right now, and it is a mystery. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. This is so important and helpful as we study the New Testament when you see this truth about the mystery that we are in a time when God is taking out of the world both Jew and Gentile, and he's making one new man, according to Ephesians 2. Uh, both Jew and Gentile, through faith in Jesus Christ, are the church, the body of Christ, the new man. Here in Colossians chapter 1, notice verse 26 and 27. I'll begin reading in verse 24 to set the context. Paul writes, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery, which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints, to them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We are indwelt by Christ. Christ is in us, and we are in him. This is this glorious truth of the church. We are in Christ as believers in Jesus Christ in this age. And this was not known in the Old Testament. It's a mystery truth revealed in the New Testament. It has been revealed since the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost through God's holy apostles and prophets. The Apostle Paul was the chief prophet, the chief apostle who revealed this truth. And it's recorded throughout his New Testament epistles, our position in Christ. And so we should live we need to behave in a way that reflects the fact that Jesus Christ, our Savior, is living in us. This is what God calls us to when he says, be holy. Why? Because Christ is in you, and Christ is holy, and we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, and God wants his church to be holy. Let me show you that. Go to Ephesians chapter 5, please. Just turn backwards, two letters to Ephesians chapter 5. And I want to read verses 25 through 27. The Apostle Paul is taking just a practical illustration. He's talking about the marriage, a husband and a wife, and how the two become one. And he's using it to illustrate the relationship that Jesus Christ has with his church he is the bridegroom, and the church is his bride. That's very clear as Paul gives this whole passage and especially concludes it in verses 32 and 33 that the church is the bride of Christ. Notice in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That, there's a purpose, there's a reason, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. God is looking for a pure church. He doesn't want us to be 
muddying ourselves up with our sins in the past we've seen in 1 Peter chapter 3, our aimless conduct. We've been redeemed from that to live a life of holiness, a life of good works, a life that is pleasing to God. And, and notice the interaction of the word of God here in verse 26. A part of this is our daily sanctification as we are reading and studying and memorizing the word of God. What is God doing? He's cleansing us from our aimless conduct we receive from the traditions of our fathers. In the word of God, we find a whole new tradition that God wants us to embrace, and that is to love one another, to love God with all our heart, and to demonstrate this reality, Christ is in us. We are to live with that. And, and here again, as ex explained in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, there's a call in verse 27 that it is to be a life that is holy, a holy church without blemish. God is looking for his bride to be pure, to be a testimony of her glorious Savior, the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. How about it? Is the church special to you? Is being a child of God special to you? Is the position that God has given to you that through faith in Jesus Christ, you are in Christ and this glorious truth Christ lives in you? Is it special to you? Is your life all about him now or is it for self? Is it all about what's going on in this world or is it all about what God is doing in this world? There's a big difference, a very big difference. And God wants his church to be holy without blemish. And God has purposed to accomplish this in us. Jesus Christ lives within us. And so I want to take the last few moments that I have together within you this morning to talk about the divine enablement then. There is a divine enablement that God has given to us as children. He's given to us his word. We see that here in Ephesians chapter 5. And through the immersing ourselves in the word of God, God is cleansing us that we might live a life of holiness and be holy and without blemish for him. God wants to do that. And by the way, the, the, I hope you don't miss the application of this. There's such an important application of this. If you are not reading God's word daily, then you are not enjoying the cleansing that God has given to you through means of his holy word. The application is read God's word. Memorize God's word. Because we're now going to see the spirit of God takes God's word and uses God's word to transform God's children to be like their savior, Jesus Christ. It's so precious. And it's all a part of this glorious truth. It's so very very important. First of all, go to Colossians again, but this time chapter 3. Go back to Colossians in chapter 3. The life of Christ is the wonderful outworking of our position in Christ. We are in Christ, and so we now have the life of Christ in us. Colossians chapter 3. And uh, just so you know, the context begins back in chapter 2 where the Apostle Paul says in verse 20 of chapter 2, if you died with Christ. Remember, chapter divisions are very, very helpful, but they're not divine. They've been put in to help us to navigate our way around God's word. But this chapter division breaks the continuity of a thought. And Paul is teaching about practical sanctification in the life of the believer, which is what we're talking about. And he introduces a thought in chapter 2, verse 20, if you died with Christ. And we have seen in our study over the last two weeks, Romans chapter 6, that if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you died with him. Remember, we've been united together in his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. We've been united together with him, Romans 6. Paul says here in Colossians 2, verse 20, if you died with Christ, this means that now old things. It's possible that old things can pass away. And that's God's intention, is that old things should pass away. But I would draw your attention now to the other side of the same thought. Chapter 3, verse 1, continuing the thought. If then you were raised with Christ. Do you see how chapter 2, verse 20 and chapter 3, verse 1 are intricately united together? Keep the thoughts together. 
Chapter 3, verse 1, If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. It's a mystery. Our position in Christ means our life is hidden, and our life is hidden with, together with Jesus Christ in God. We saw in Ephesians 2, we've been raised up together and made to sit together where? In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our life is hid with Christ in God. The world does not see your position in Christ. They don't see it. And I might add, it's not conscious to you if you don't believe it, if you don't think about it and dwell upon it and believe it. There are too many Christians who don't take the time to dig into God's word and see these truths and then just believe it. I'm in Christ, and Christ is in me. And that's the position that I am now going to think and live and make my decisions. This is a real reprimand to us. I may in my home be upset with someone, and I may lash out with words that are not very Christ-like. I was not thinking about my position in Christ, was I, when I did that? I wasn't believing that I'm in Christ, because when that family member treated me the way they did, it might be a brother or a sister. It might be an aunt or an uncle. It might be a spouse. It could be any family member who treats you. And you might be tempted to think, you can't treat me like that. But you may in faith embrace your position in Christ and realize God has placed me above all this. And from my heavenly position, I want to respond to this one who's treating me who's speaking to me in the way that Jesus Christ would be honored and blessed. Do you see it? Do you see the reality of it? If you then were raised with Christ, we are to be thinking about things which are above. We're to be setting our mind and our thinking on things which are above so that we might by faith begin to live from our heavenly position and responding to life circumstances. Maybe it's not your family. Maybe it's your place of employment. Maybe it's your place of education. Maybe it's just your neighbor across the street or on the other side of the fence. And you might be tempted the way they treat or talk to you to show them they can't do that to you. But don't do it. That's the flesh. Think upon things above. I am positioned in Christ in heavenly places. I'm above all of this. And I want to respond now to my neighbor in a way that demonstrates Jesus Christ to them. How can you do that? Answer, Colossians 1.27, Christ is in you. And that is a wonderful truth. And may God encourage our hearts to set our mind on things above, not on things on the earth, that we may do what? We may show forth the life of Christ. Listen, let me conclude it with verse 4 here, not our message, this thought. <laughs> when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Let me ask you a question. When you spoke to your husband or your wife that way last week, or you spoke to your neighbor or your aunt or your uncle or your employer or whoever it is that way last week, how would you feel if in that moment the trumpet sounded and you were called in a moment in the twinkling of an eye to meet Jesus Christ in the air. That's a real penetrating, sobering thought. All of a sudden, I'm called into account to my Savior, Jesus Christ. Won't you rejoice if you're thinking on things above and responding from your heavenly position? This is a wonderful truth. I want to respond to this I'm above all this. I'm positioned in heavenly places in Christ. And I want to respond to this from my heavenly position in a way that honors my glorious Savior. Are you looking for help? Are you looking for help? God has supplied it. Let's turn to John, the Gospel, chapter 14. The Lord Jesus Christ, in the very intimate and private, private setting of the upper room, 
spoke words to his disciples pointing to and speaking of this wonderful truth of which we are discussing that was coming. And Jesus did not explain it in depth. He focused on this aspect of it, the divine enablement of something that would be revealed later on in the New Testament epistles, our position in Christ. God was going to give us some help. Do you need help? I do. Do you need help? I need help. Especially when I want to be serious about being a holy example and testimony, living a conduct that is good and holy and righteous. I need some help. God wants to give that. Here in John chapter 14, please notice with me verses 15 through 17, Jesus in this very intimate, this very private, this is not a public setting. He's only speaking now to the eleven those who will go forth in his name, and they are going to have a great privilege. What's the privilege that these 11 are going to have? In this moment, they have no clue. They're not thinking about it. Jesus has already told them more than once, but they're going to have an opportunity to be a living witness of a risen Savior. Jesus is going to the cross. And this very night in which he speaks these words, he will be betrayed by one of the twelve, Judas, with a kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane. He will turn Jesus over to the religious leaders of Israel who have wanted to get their hands on Jesus for some two and a half years now. That's going to happen on this very night. But to the eleven, Jesus is going to speak words of help. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, comforter. The Greek word is the paraclete, another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and, you ready? Will be in you. He will be in you. Now, they had experienced the blessed ministry of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, these three and a half years, eating with him, ministering together with him as Jesus healed the sick, gave the blind their sight, caused the lame to walk, cast out demons, and then he even gave a measure of the Holy Spirit to them and sent them to do the same, casting out demons and healing in the name of Jesus Christ proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom is what they did at that particular time. But Jesus now is telling them, I'm going away. Notice here in verse 18, Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Jesus was going to come to them, and he was going to come to them in the person of the Holy Spirit. And they were going to see Jesus Christ risen from the dead, and they were going to become a living witness, living witness, alive because they've been made alive together with Christ. Once he sent forth his Holy Spirit, he told them, tarry in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Spirit because I will come to you. And he came to them how? He tells them right here, verse 16, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper. Who is this helper? The Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth is that comforter. And I want to point out this word, another. Do you see it in verse 16? And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. In the Greek language, there's two different words for another. Did you know that? There's two different words. There's alos and there's heteros. They both mean another. But they mean another in a distinctly, distinctly different way. Alos in the Greek, means another of the exact same kind. Heteros means another of a different kind. Let me explain to you what I mean. If I were, I should have brought it with me, if I were to hold up two apples this morning, and I had a golden delicious apple, and I had a Macintosh apple, right? Now, I could say to you, I have an apple, and I have another apple, right? And I would use the word alas because they're both apples. They're both, there's a, a difference between them of a little bit different tartness and sweetness, but they're both apples. 
another apple. But now if I didn't have two apples, if I had an apple and I had an orange, I'm trying to make this real simple, I could say to you, I have an apple and I have another piece of fruit, couldn't I? And I could use that word heteros because even though it's another piece of fruit, there's a difference between the two, isn't there? Apples and oranges, that's the part I'm trying to make it simple. The word here is alas, another of the same kind. I'm going to send you another helper. And the spirit of truth is going to come and he's going to be with you. Why? Look at chapter 16. John chapter 16, please. Notice, first of all, verse 7. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. That's what Jesus told them in the upper room. I'm going to send this other helper, this other helper of the same kind, the spirit of truth, I'm going to send him. He's going to have a ministry to the world. Verses 8 down through and verse 12 is going to talk about the ministry that the Holy Spirit's going to have in the world. But pick it up in verse 13. In verse 13, Jesus says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, here's the ministry he's going to have to you, my children, believers in Jesus Christ. He, the Spirit of truth, has come. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you all things to come. He will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, that's Jesus Christ, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. That is going to include the precious truth of the mystery our position in Christ. He's going to take of Christ and he's going to reveal to you things I have not yet told you, wonderful truths about the position that you will have in me, in Jesus Christ. Wonderful. He will glorify me, verse 14, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and will declare it to you. God has sent forth the comforter. And the comforter is that helper, that paraclete who comes alongside to comfort, to encourage, to admonish, to marvelously enable. I don't have time to go through all the blessed truth in the New Testament on this. So let me just give you one passage before we part this morning. Would you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3? 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The New Testament now declares this blessed truth that there is a divine enablement. Help. How can I now live my position in Christ? How can I live believing and wonderfully demonstrating the life of Jesus Christ in me. Jesus said, I have sent forth my spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit of God, who is going to come and live within you. And that's what he does today. Why? To make real our position in Christ and teach us, cleanse us, enable us. He is going to wonderfully enable the children of God to live their position in Christ. Notice here in 2 Corinthians Chapter 3, Paul is talking about the difference between the Old Covenant, Sinai, and the New Covenant at Calvary. Two different mounts, two different promises, and a covenant at Mount Sinai for the nation of Israel. At Calvary, Jesus Christ shed his blood, which became the basis through which the church come to, in, comes into existence. Through faith in Jesus Christ, a whole new dynamic God sent forth his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And now, because of our faith in Jesus Christ and the blood he shed on the cross, we are brought near and we are baptized into the body of Christ. So what is the Holy Spirit who's come to live within us to take of what is Jesus Christ and to reveal it and to make it known and to make it work in us going to do something gloriously new 
And, and Paul writes about it here in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 7, all the way through the end of the chapter. But let me point, please, to verses 16, 17, and 18. Paul writes, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Today, right now, today, unbelieving Israel has a veil over their eyes. They read the scriptures. They probably just read in the synagogues on Sabbath yesterday. They probably read the book of Esther. Probably. It's Purim. Yep. But they don't see and understand the scriptures the way the child of God does because there's a veil. Because they have rejected Jesus Christ, they don't understand. That's what Paul's talking about here. But notice, when one turns to the Lord, when one believes in Jesus Christ, that veil is taken away. That veil of unbelief is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty, freedom, an enablement. We all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. When the believer places their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are placed in Christ, and Christ comes to live within us. How does Christ come to live within us? God has sent forth His Spirit into our hearts to take the things of Christ, to work them out through the believing believer as they believe these truths revealed in God's word. And notice here, the emphasis is a transformation to even be more and more like him. The mirror that we are looking in is the word of God. And as John, uh, Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5, remember the washing of the water by what means? The blessed and holy word of God. Here in 2 Corinthians 3, as we are beholding in God's word, it's like a mirror revealing God's glory to us. The Spirit of God does something wonderful. He not only takes the truth of God and cleanses you, He takes the truth of God and He transforms you. Do you believe that? If you do, God's going to do a work in your life. I was blessed this week when I was reminded that Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, a little bit of faith will get you to heaven. A little bit of faith in Jesus Christ. But a lot of faith will bring heaven to you. He spoke more, more than we readily understand. May God open our minds and our hearts because he's provided an enablement. Our good behavior in Christ is buttressed by the word of God and enabled by the spirit of God so that we might live like children of God, holy, honoring our Heavenly Father as pilgrims in this present age. John Bunyan wrote a poem. I'd like to close my service with it this morning. He wrote, Who would true valor see? Let him come hither. One here will constant be, come wind, come weather. There's no discouragement shall make him once relent his first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. Whoso beset him round with dismal stories do but themselves confound. His strength the more is. No lion can him fright. He'll with a giant fight. But he will have a right to be a pilgrim. Hobgoblin nor fouled fien can daunt his spirit. He knows he's at the end, shall life inherit. Then fancies fly away. He'll fear not what men say. He'll labor night and day to be a pilgrim. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Thank you for this glorious truth, our position in Christ. And it is in your purpose and wisdom that you hid things in ages past, but have made it known in this age. And Father, these things have now been revealed for some 2,000 years on the pages of scriptures. And here we are today, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
O Lord, I pray that we would honor you as pilgrims on this journey that we are here in earth as children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that we would be a careful to attend to our good behavior in Jesus Christ. No matter what men may say, maligning and accusing, I pray that we will be committed by the word of God, by the spirit of God, to our position in our blessed, heavenly, holy behavior in Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray, amen. As we close this morning, I invite you to turn with me in your...